Hey guys, don't worry, you did not miss a stream. This is a special recording of um, my reading of House in Many Ways by Diane Wayne Jones. Um, the reason why is I wanted to try and finish this book up so we could start the next book in the series. Uh, not the series, um, the next book that I'm going to be reading, which will be revealed very soon. So I hope you guys will enjoy. We are going to start chapter 13. So thank you so much for being here and let's get started. Chapter 13, in which Calcifer is very active. Calcifer's orange eyes turned to Sophie. Do you need me to keep guard here still? He asked her, or can you manage with just the two of you? Sophie gazed worriedly at, worriedly out at the well-dressed chattering crowd. I don't think anyone's going to try anything just now, she said. But come back quickly. I have horrible forbidding feeling, I mean, foreboding feeling. I don't trust the mob-eyed fellow an inch or that nasty prince either. All right, quick it is, Calcifer Crackle. Stand up, young Carmen. I'm going to sit on your hands. <laughs> Carmen got to her feet, expecting to be burned or at least singed at any moment. Morgan objected to her going by waving a yellow brick at her and raising a booming shout of, Keen! 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 Shush! Sophie and Twinkle said together, and the fat nursemaid added, Master Morgan, we don't shout. Not here in front of the king. It's yellow, Carmen said, waiting for the staring faces to turn away. She was beginning to see that none of the fine guests knew that Calcifer was part of the fire and that Calcifer wanted to keep it that way. As soon as everyone lost interest and turned back to their chatter, Calcifer hopped out of the fire and landed just slightly above Carmen's nervous fingers in the exact likeness of a plate of cake. He did not hurt a bit. In fact, Carmen could scarcely feel him. Clever, she said. Pretend to hold me, Calcifer replied, and walk out of the room with me. Carmen curled her fingers round the false plate and walked toward the door. Prince Ludovic to her relief, had moved away, but the king was coming toward her instead. He nodded and smiled at Carmen. Cut yourself some cake, I see, he said. Good, isn't it? Wish I knew why we have all these rocking horses. Don't happen to know, do you? Carmen looked at her head. Carmen shook her head. Wow, that was definitely not the right way. Carmen shook her head, and the king turned away, still smiling. Why do we? Oh, why do we? Carmen asked. Have all these rocking horses. Protection, said the plate of cake. Open the door and let's get out of here. Carmen took one hand from the false plate, opened the door and slipped out into the damp echoing hallway. But who's being, who, but, but, Who's being protected from what? She asked, closing the door as quietly as possible. Morgan, said the plate of, of cake. Sophie got an anonymous note this morning. It said, stop your investigation and leave High Nordland or your child suffers. But we can't leave because Sophie promised the princess she'll stay until we find out where all the money's gone. Tomorrow we're going to pretend to go. Calcifer was interpreted by, interrupted by shrill barking. Waif came dashing round the corner and hurled herself delightedly into Carmen's ankles. Calcifer jumped and floated free in his own shape, a fiery blue teardrop hovering by Carmen's shoulder. Carmen scooped Waif up. How did you? She began trying to keep her face out of the way of Waif's eager tongue. Then she realized that Waif was not in the least bit wet. Oh, Calcifer, she m 
must have come the quick way through the house. Can you find me the conference room? I can get us back from there. Easy, Calcifer darted off like a blue comet so fast that Carmen had trouble keeping up. He whirled round several corners and into the corridor where the kitchen smells were. In next to no time, Carmen was standing with her back to the door of the conference room with Waif in her arms and Calcifer floating by her shoulder while she tried to remember just what you did from there. Calcifer said, it's like this and zigzagged away in front of her. Carmen followed as best as she could and found herself in the corridor where the bedrooms were. Sunlight was blazing in the window beyond Great Uncle William's study. Peter came dashing toward them, looking pale and urgent. Oh, good dog, Waif, he said. I sent her to fetch you. Just come and take a look at this. He turned and galloped back over to the other end of the corridor, where he pointed rather shakily at the view of the window. Out in the mountain meadow, the rain was just passing away in big, melting, dark gray clouds that were obviously still raining below on the town. The rainbow arched across the mountains, lured in front of the clouds, and a pale mist, pale misty across the meadow. The meadow grass blazed and twinkled so with the sunlight, wait, with the sunlit wetness that Carmen was dazzled for a moment and could not see what Peter was pointing at. That's the Lubbock, Peter said rather hoarsely, right? The Lubbock was there, towering huge and purple in the middle of the meadow. It was bending slightly to listen to a kobold who was hopping up and down, pointing at the rainbow and evidently shouting at the Lubbock. That the Lubbock all right Carmen said sh shivering and that's Rollo as she said it the Lubbock laughed and rolled his bundles of insect eyes toward the rainbow it stepped carefully backward until the misty rainbow stripes seemed to be right beside his insect feet there he bent and dragged a small Earthen war earthenware pot out of the turf. Rollo capered about. That must be the crock of gold that at the end of the rainbow, Peter said wonderingly. They watched the Lubbock pass the pot to Rollo, who took it in both arms and was evidently heavy. Rollo stopped capering and staggered about with his head thrown back in greedy joy he turned to, to stagger away he did not see the lubbock slyly extend his long purple um pro, pro probus because i don't know the weird buggy insect thingies that are gross he did not seem to notice when the probe stabbed into his back. He just sank away into the meadow grass, still clutching the pot and laughing. The Lubbock laughed too, standing in the middle of the meadow and waving his insect arms. It's just laid eggs in Rollo, Carmen said. And he didn't even notice. She felt ill. The same thing had so nearly happened to her. Peter looked quite green, and Waif was shivering. You know, she said, I think the Lubbock may have promised Rollo a crock of gold for making trouble between the Colodes and Great Uncle William. I'm sure it did, Peter said. Before you got here, I could hear Rollo yelling that he needed to be paid. He opened the window to listen. Carmen thought, the silly fool. I have to declare. I have to declare war, Calcifer said. He had gone rather wispy and pale. 
He added in a small hiss that trembled slightly. I have to fight that Lubbock, or I won't deserve the life that Sophie gave me. One moment. He stopped speaking and hung in the air, long and stiff, with his orange eyes closed. Are you the fire demon? Peter asked. I've never seen one before. Quiet, said Calcifer. I'm concentrating. This has to be right. There was a slight rumbling from somewhere. Then overhead and across the window from behind came what Carmen at first took for a thundercloud. It threw a large black turret shadow along the meadow, which very quickly reached the rejoicing Lubbock. The Lubbock looked round as the shadow fell across it and froze for an instant. Then it started to run. By this time, the, the turd shower, shadow had been followed by the castle that was making it a tall black castle built of huge blocks of dark stone with turrets on all four corners. They could see the big stone and was made a shaking and grinding noise as it moved. It came after the Lubbock faster than the Lubbock could run. The Lubbock dodged the castle, swerved after it. The Lubbock spread its small fuzzy wings for more speed and went bounding in furious stride to the tall rocks at the end of the meadow. As soon as it reached the rocks, it turned round and came rushing the other way toward the window. It must have hoped that the castle would crash into the rocks, but the castle reversed itself with no trouble at all, and it came after it even faster than ever. Big puffs of black smoke went belching from the castle's turrets and floating away across the fading rainbow. The Lubbock sw sw swiveled. One of its multiple eyes had as it ran, then put its insect head down and pleated feelers flapping wings beating in a big curve that took in along the very edge of the cliff although its wings were now purple blurs it seemed not to be able to fly with them at all carmen understood why it had not tried to follow her down from the cliff it could not have been able to fly back up instead of jumping off the cliff to escape the lubbock simply kept on running tempted tempting the castle to fall and fall off the edge. The castle did not follow. I mean, the castle did follow. It came steaming and puffing and grinding at speed along the cliff and seemed perfectly balanced in spite of the way half of it was hanging over the edge. The Lubbock gave out a despairing hoot, changing direction again and rushing out into the corner of the meadow. There it played its last trick and and went small. It shrank into a teeny purple insect and plunged it in almost the grass, plunged in among the grass and flowers. The castle was on to the spot in an instant. It shuddered to a stop over the place where the Lubbock had vanished and floated there. The flames began to come out of its flat underside, yellow flames first, then orange, then angry red, and finally a white hotness that was too bring to look that was too bright to look at. Flames that thick smoke licked up its sides and joined the dark smokes streaming from its turrets. The meadow filled with hot black fog for what seemed hours but was probably only minutes. The castle was a dim, hovering shape over smoky brightness, like the sun seen through clouds. They could hear the roar of burning even behind the magical window. Right, Calcifer said. I think that's done it. He turned to Carmen, and she noticed that his eyes were now a strange shining silver. 
Will you open up the window, please? I have to go and make sure. Carmen turned the catch and swung the window open. The castle rose up and moved sideways. All the, all the smoke and fogs collected into a large dark puff which rolled across the edge of the cliff and out into the valley where it shredded away into nothingness. When Calcifer floated toward, floated over toward the meadow, the castle was standing demorally with only a wisp of smoke coming from each turret. Beside a big patch of black earth, a perfectly horrible smell rolled in through the window. Ugh, Carmen said. What is that? Roast Lubbock, I hope, Peter said. They watched Calcifer float to the to the burned square. There he became a blue streak of action, whirling his way across the blackness along until he was covered in every teeny scrap of it. He came floating back with his eyes a normal orange again. That's it, he said cheerfully. Gone. And so are a lot of flowers, Carmen thought, but it did not seem polite to say so. The important thing was that the Lubbock was gone, truly gone. The flowers will grow again next year. Calcifer said to her, what did you come to fetch me for, this Lubbock? No, the Lubbock eggs, Peter and Carmen said together. They explained about the elf and what the elf had said. Show me, said Calcifer. They went to the kitchen, all except Wave, who whined and refused to go in there. There, Carmen had a fine sunlit view of the yard out of the window full of dripping pink, white, and red laundry still on the clotheslines. Peter had obviously not bothered to fetch it in. She wondered what he had been doing. The glass box was still on the table, still with the eggs in it, but it had sunk into the table somehow, so that only half of it was showing. What made it do that, Carmen asked? The magic in the eggs? Peter looked a little self-conscious. Not exactly. He said, that happened when I put my safety spell on it. I was going back to the study to look up another spell when I saw Rollo talking to the Lubbock. Isn't that typical, Carmen thought. This fool always thinks he knows best. The elf spells would have been quite enough, Calcifer said. The elf spells would have been quite enough, Calcifer said, floating above the embedded glass box. But he said it was dangerous, Peter protested. You've made it more dangerous, Calcifer said. Don't either of you come any nearer. No one can touch the box now. Does one of you know any good, good know of a good stout layer of rock where I can go destroy these eggs? Peter tried not to look chastened. Carmen remembered her fall from the cliff and how she had nearly landed on a on big rocks before she started to fly. She did her best to describe to Calcifer where those crags were. Under the cliff, I see, Calcifer said. One of you open the back door, please, and then stand back. Peter hurried to open the door. Carmen could see he was quite ashamed of what he had done to the glass box. But it won't stop him from doing something just as silly another time, she thought. I wish he'd learn. Calcifer hovered over the glass box for a moment, then whirled to open the door. Halfway through the doorway, he seemed to stick, jerking and trembling. He gave a mighty heave, doubling himself up like a large blue tadpole 
and then slamming himself straight again. The shot forward across the colorful washing. The glass box came loose with a scrape and a sound like someone throwing a wooden planks about and shot after him. In it floating over the, the yard, eggs and all, following Kelsifer's small blue teardrop shape, Peter and Carmen went to the door and watched the glass box glinting its way up across the green hillside toward the Lubbock meadow until it was out of sight. Oh, Carmen said, I forgot to tell him that Prince Lud Ludovic is a Lubbockan. Is he really? Peter said as he shut the door. That must explain why my mother left this country then. Carmen had never had much interest in Peter's mother. She, she turned impatiently away and saw that the table was now flat again. That was a relief. She had been wondering what you did. She, she had been wondering what you did with, the ta with a table that had a square trench in the middle of it. What safety spell did you use? She said. I'll show you, Peter said. I want to have another sight on the castle anyways. Do you think we dare open that window and climb out near to it? No, Carmen said. But the Lubbock's definitely dead, Peter said. There can't be any harm in it. Carmen had a very strong feeling that Peter was asking for trouble. How do you know there was only one Lubbock, she said. The encyclopedia said, Peter argued, Lubbock's are solitary. Arguing fiercely about it, they wrangled their way through the inner door and turned left into the corridor. There, Peter made a definite dash to the window. Carmen dashed after him and held him back by his jacket. Wave dashed after them, squeaking with distress and contrived to tangle herself with Peter's feet so that he fell forward with both hands on the window. Carmen looked nervously out at the meadow, gleaming peacefully in the orange sunlit, the orange sunset, sunset light, where the castle was still squatting beside the burned black patch. It was one of the queerest buildings she had ever seen. There was a flash of light so bright that it blinded them. Instance, other, ugh. instance later, there came the clap of an explosion as loud as the light was bright. The floor beneath them jiggled and the window blurred its, in its frames. Carmen thought she was, she saw the castle vibrating all over. With ears fuzzy and deaf, she thought she heard rocks crash and grind and, tr and tumble. Clever waif, she thought. If Peter had been outside, he might be dead by now. What do you think that was? Peter asked when they could almost hear again. Calcifer destroying the Lubbock A's, of course, said Carmen. The rocks he went to are straight under the meadow. They both blinked and blinked, trying to clear away the blobs of blue and gray and yellow dazzling yellow dazzle that would keep floating inside their eyes. They both peered and peered. It was hard to believe it, but nearly half of the meadow was now missing. A, cur a curved piece like a huge bite had gone from the sloping green space. Below, there, below that, there must have been quite a landslide. Hmm, said Peter. Do you think that he destroyed himself as well, do you? You don't think that he destroyed himself as well, do you? They waited and watched. Sounds came back to their ears almost as 
usual part from as a usual part from a little fizzing the blots gradually faded from their eyes after a while they both noticed that the castle was drifting in a sad lost way across the meadow toward the rocks at the other end they waited and watched until it drifted up over the rocks and out of sight along the mountainside there was still no sign of calcifer he probably came back to the kitchen peter suggested they went back and they opened the back door and peered out among the laundry but there was no sign anywhere of the floating blue teardrop They went through the living room and opened the front door, but the only blue out there was the hydrangeas. Do fire demons die? Peter said. I have no idea, Carmen said. As always, in times of trouble, she knew what she wanted to do. I'm going to read a book, she said. She sat on the nearest sofa, pulled her glasses up, and picked up the magician's journey up off the floor. Peter gave an angry sigh and went away. But it was no good. Carmen could not concentrate. She kept thinking of Sophie and of Morgan too. It was quite plain to see her to her that Calcifer was, in some strange way, part of Sophie's family. It would be even worse so than losing you, she said to Wave, who had come to sit on her shoes. She wondered if she should go to the royal mansion and tell Sophie what happened, but it was dark now. Sophie was probably having to probably having formal supper sitting opposite the Lubbock prince with candles and things. Carmen did not think she dared interrupt another occasion in the mansion. Besides, Sophie was worried sick about the th that threat to Morgan. Carmen did not want to worry her more, and perhaps Calcifer would turn up in the morning. He was made of fire, after all. On the other hand, that explosion was enough to blow anything to bits, Carmen thought. Carmen thought of the blue fl of bits of blue flame scattered about inside a landslide. Peter came back into the living room. I know what we ought to do, he said. Yes, Carmen said eagerly. We ought to go and tell the kobolds about Rolo, Peter said. Carmen stared, took her glasses off, and stared more clearly. What, if the, what have the kobolds got to do with Calcifer? Nothing, Peter said rather puzzled. But we can prove that the Lubbock paid Rolo to make trouble. Carmen wondered whether to spring up and hit him round the head with the magician's journey. Bother the kobolds! We ought to go now, Peter began. Pro per per perviously. Before in the morning, Carmen said firmly and definitely. In the morning after. We've been up to those rocks to see what happened to Calcifer. But, said Peter, because, Carmen said quickly, thinking of reasons, Rolo's going to be off somewhere hiding his crock of gold. He ought to be there when you accuse him. To her surprise, Peter thought about this and agreed with her. And we ought to tidy up Wizard Norland's bedroom, he said, in case they bring him back tomorrow. You go and do that, Carmen said, before I throw my book at you, she thought, and probably the vase of flowers after that. And that was the end of chapter 13. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here, and I hope you enjoyed this chapter. I will see you for the next one. Bye-bye!